Good morning. Hi, it's Behind the Headlines on WLIW-FM. I'm Bill Sutton. I'm the managing editor of the Express News Group. Joe Shaw, my usual co-host, is on vacation this week. Good for him. Um, I hope he's listening in. Joining me as co-host today is Annette Hinkle. She's the arts and living editor for the Express News Group. Hello, Annette. Good morning. Hey, Bill. How are you? This is new for me. You know that, right? (laughs) It is. You're going to be fine. We're going to have fun. Um, also joining me is Joe, Joe Workmeister. He's the editor of the Suffolk Times and the Riverhead News Review. Good morning, Joe. Good morning. Good to be here again. And Michael Mackey, who's the local host for Long Island Morning Edition on WLIW-FM. This is old hat for you, Michael. Good morning. Good morning and welcome. And um, and and here we go. Did I, did I miss anybody? You missed oh, Beth I, I'm sorry, Beth, Beth Young, publisher and editor of East End Beacon. I'm going out of order on my list. I'm sorry, Beth. Don't worry, Beth. My apologies. Good morning. How are you? Great. Good. So I, I think we were going to start with, uh, with the big news this week. U.S. Representative Lee Zeldin, who had been talking for um, kind of uh, a couple a couple weeks or, or a month or so about uh, dipping his toe into the water of the governor's race, has officially announced that he will seek the Republican nomination to uh, for governor in 2022. Um, Mr. Zeldin, of course, was a big supporter of President Donald Trump and caught some attention that way. He made his announcement on Fox, uh, Fox and Friends this week. Um, and sent out a press release. Oddly, he doesn't um, he doesn't respond to a lot of reporters um, anymore. I'm hoping that that'll change now that uh, now that he's got his sights set on Albany. He was a, he's not unfamiliar to Albany. He was a state senator for for two terms. How do we all feel about uh, about him running for uh, for governor? I know that um, some of us aren't really fans. I just wonder, can he really, does he have a, much of a shot at a Democratic leaning state? You know, it just seems like this is maybe not the best, you know, the best demographic for him is my thought. Yeah, I think the last the last Republican to win a statewide office on that level was George Pataki. And that was 20 years ago, right? That's exactly right. Yeah. But on the other hand, you know, after the pandemic, you have a lot of um a lot of New Yorkers fleeing the state, especially from the city, taking their money elsewhere. So maybe the more conservative message hits a tone after all of the financial difficulties that COVID caused. Mm-hmm. Well, people who have left have left. <laughs> yeah. Are they still registered to vote here? <laughs> maybe. Well, well, and you have to wonder, you know, all the controversies surrounding, you know, Governor Cuomo right now, what effect that's going to have on an upcoming election, whether whether he's going to seek reelection or not, if he's right. still around by that point, And, you know, and who steps up in his place? I don't know that there's any big name Democrats to 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 step in either. Yeah, I think it's interesting just, you know, how in the first congressional district, um, you know, Zeldin has really done uh, pretty well for himself. And, um, you know, I would think that's a seat that you know, they wouldn't necessarily want to just give up um, and potentially get back to the Democrats. It's, you know, the, you know the, the big goal for the Republicans coming up in the midterm is going to be try to take back the House. So, um, you know, obviously he can't run for governor and that first congressional seat at the same time. Yeah. Um, so they would have to run, you know, a, a new candidate for uh, that seat uh, for Congress in the House. So I don't know who that would be. Um, I, I don't either. Do you think they feel pretty confident, though, that given the demographics of the def- district, like you said, I mean, it's it's strong Republican on the west end of the district. Yeah, but, but, but you know, I did read this morning that Zeldin only won by four percentage points this last election. So mm-hmm. uh, his popularity is waning a bit. You know, you do have a lot more, I think, liberal Democrats moving out to the east end um, to kind of thwarted that vote. Um, so I'm not sure that, that it's a shoe. And plus, they're talking about redistricting and that could change the face of this district. So I, I don't think it's as, as sure a bet for him to get to get reelected in 2022 as it you know may have been a few years ago. Maybe. One of the things he was saying when he was first um, kind of throwing it out there that he may run was that he, you know, he wouldn't do it unless he really thought he could win. So, you know, I, I don't know exactly you know, what they did sort of in these last few weeks to kind of, I guess, get that confidence that they feel like they really do have a shot. Um, but, you know, it seemed like he, you know, he does uh, seriously believe he's got a good chance you know, to win the, the, 
the governor's race. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. You know, I, obviously, I think he would do well in Suffolk County um, and probably across Long Island. You know, probably would get a you know, good good amount of votes. But you know, when you know, when you, if you should really struggle in the city, and and you know, that's obviously represents so many votes there. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, that, I think Cuomo won with some something over sixty percent of the votes in the last election. So that's a pretty pretty big margin to make up. Yep. There's a variety of elements involving this situation. And if Zeldin actually does get the nomination, of course, our first congressional district is then wide open. The incumbent tends to uh, not do as well in the off uh, year elections in Congress, because during the presidential election, actually this past one, uh, Zeldin did better than he did back in 2018. The Trumpsters came out to vote for the, uh, President Trump, and they also voted for Zeldin. In 2022, there aren't going to be any coattails for the Republican to um, hold on to. So it's a little bit more open for the Democrats in uh, 2022, the first congressional district. But it's fascinating to think about and speculate who the various um, candidates might be. Who would represent the Democratic Party in 2022? Bridget Fleming, I heard some talk that they'll uh, approach Fred Thiel Jr., an independent, and see if he would uh, represent the, the Democratic Party and run for the nomination. As, as far as Zeldin's uh, potential success in the state, he'll score very well in the first congressional district, and he'll score well in sections of uh, New York that are conservative. But is it possible for a conservative uh, the Trumpster to uh, get enough votes to overcome all the votes he'll lose in the cities, especially uh, the greater New York City metropolitan area. So for uh, as far as behind the headlines, there's a lot to cover there. And it's intriguing as to whether Zel whether or not Zeldin gets the uh, nomination. Yeah. As you pointed out before, Joe, it's if he uh, if he's gone this far, presumably he's done the research and knows that he has a, a good chance. But it could be ego and and uh, perhaps his friends at Fox are telling him, go for it. And yeah, I'm sure he's got a the... safe uh, fallback option, too, yeah. if uh, things don't work out for him. You know, I sure, think, uh, that's exactly he could slide right. right into Fox News right. doing whatever. Right. He's only 41 years old. If he loses the, uh, the if he loses the election with governor, well, it's a Democratic state. It's a it's a it's a blue state. Give him uh, credit for trying and he'll, he'll fall on his feet somewhere else within the Republican conservative uh, spectrum and run again someday somewhere. So, so what do we think? I mean, he's he's certainly been riding those the the Trumpster coattails, as as you said, Michael. Do we think that that by the election in twenty twenty two, there's going to be a resurgence of of support for for Trump and and that, um, you know that that segment of of the party, or is it is it dying off? Or is there going to be a new party? Um, I mean, that's certainly a question on on whether whether there's that resurgence and and whether that support is going to be still there. For him at yeah, that that's that's a good question throughout the country. Yeah. And uh, we're a microcosm of that. Does Trump still have that hold on the Republican Party and the uh, the conservative uh, right wing? It appears he does. I don't believe Zeldin mentioned Trump in his uh, press release or on Fox uh, News yesterday. Mm, no, he didn't. Bring him up at all from he did. So maybe there'll be a third party at that point, too. Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> his, his campaign ad was very much um, the same scare tactics he used in the uh, in the general election last year. You know, yeah, New York crime and going downhill. We need to save it. And, 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 so, our I mean, last well, chance to save the state. And to to totally it? anti Cuomo, as as I, I imagine any Republican would be at this point, given the the controversy surrounding the. But who the knows governor, what's going to be going on with Cuomo? But but it was yeah. interesting in, in that ad. Um, it didn't even mention Lee Zeldin's name until like, I don't know, a minute and a half or two minutes into the ad. It was just all Cuomo did this, Cuomo did that and, you know, and, and re retake the state. Um, I, I well, I also noticed that the demographics of, of the, 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 the people represented in the ad was um, maybe not what you would expect to see in a conservative Trump Trumpster um ad for for a candidate it was it was a little odd i thought well we'll see what what happens and what's trump's influence is but uh zeldin is officially announced that he's going for it he'll probably tear open and, and tear apart the new york state budget and point out 
all the uh, the factors within that that Republicans decry. It, it, that, which, once again, the New York State Legislature is a microcosm of the federal government. There's no bipartisanship there. You, the Republican, the the, uh, the Democratic Party majority in the New York State Legislature voted for the budget, and uh, many uh, Republicans are uh, pointing out uh, sections of it, especially the excluded workers segment. And I, I suspect that Zeldin will jump all over that and uh, talk about American citizenry and uh, what about our wounded war veterans and uh, homeless uh, veterans and why aren't they taking, being taken care of instead of the excluded workers? Yeah, It's going to get hot. It's going to get uh, volatile. That, yeah, it always it always seems it has to be one or the other, right? It's like correct. We can never, we can right. never help right. people together. It has to be one or the other. It seems I don't know. And this so is our sociological state right now. Yes, us versus them. Yeah, and this is all assuming well, the, that also them. Can, can get the nomination. I saw that uh, Rudy Giuliani's son, who um, who famously um, when, when he was was younger and Giuliani was first sworn in, was up on stage and captured America's heart as you know re- repeating the the oath of office as, as Rudy was being sworn in, and and that's so. Yeah. So who does who does Trump support there? Does he support his buddy Lee Zeldin or does he support? Um, Lee Zeldin's son. It'll be interesting to see, you know, to see how that that progresses, and again, what happens with the governor. Um, you're you're well, listening Andrew to Giuliani. You're, you're listening to uh, behind the headlines on WLIW FM. I'm Bill Sutton from the Express News Group, joined by Beth Young, Annette Hinkle, Michael Mackey, and Joe Workmeister. Michael, you did bring up the um, the excluded workers program. Um, funding and and I thought that was interesting so this the state legislature this week passed the 212 billion dollar state budget and that included 2.1 billion dollars for um for these excluded workers which are are mostly undocumented immigrants and and the idea is that it would make up um it would make up for people who didn't get any stimulus payments or the enhanced unemployment during the pandemic and and these um um, these people could be could be people earning less than twenty six thousand dollars a year, but they could be getting thousands of dollars in, in payments. I think up to like fifteen grand um, if they qualify for for full payments. And, and I, 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 like you said, I, Michael, I, I think that that Zeldin will make an issue of that. I was surprised that there wasn't more of an issue. I didn't hear a lot about it. There wasn't a lot of controversy about about these payments. Certainly, there was debate in the Republicans in the legislature. Um, we're, we're opposed to that. But what do we um, what do we all think about that? Well, first of all, the challenge of administering it is being criticized not only on the right, but the left, too. The, uh, the many progressives uh, feel that it's onerous. I will say this. Minerva Perez of Ola of Eastern Long Island uh, sent me a message stating that uh, she embraces it. And it's a historic moment and, uh, and had much praise for it. But there are some progressives that feel it's not enough, and the uh, the demands to provide proof is are is, is is just asking too much. In the meantime, the on the right, they'll criticize that uh, there uh, it shouldn't have been done in the first place, and so it's I don't I think it's going to boil up again soon because think, it's ongoing. I think California early on had included undocumented workers in in some of the stimulus payments out there. Right. Um, this is generally speaking unprecedented. It's uh, similar to things that have been done before, but the amount and uh, the, it, its outreach is uh, is presumed is is being referred to as historic, un- unmatched. But, uh, Beth, I mean, everybody suffered through you know through the the lockdown and the pandemic. There's no reason not to help the, those people, even even if they're here illegally. There's no reason not to help them to to survive and make up for, you know, for lost wages due to the pandemic, right? I mean, uh, um, to to make broad generalization, they were really hurt uh, as a demographic a lot harder than a lot of other people because, you know, working in service industry jobs or whatever you're working in, you can't work anymore. Um, If you're living in multi-generational housing, you're at risk. It's um, the, the... Everybody who suffered needs our help. And there are a lot of people who are U.S. citizens who didn't suffer, who got help. Right. And um, if we can do it anywhere, we can do it in New York. 
Well, there you go. I think it can be easy to sort of, you know, dehumanize these people as a broad group and you say, well, they don't deserve anything, you know, and, uh, you know, you kind of you lose perspective that, you know, you go to a restaurant and, and some person who's bringing you the food, who's, you know, 20 something years old, who speaks perfect English, you know, that could be the person we're talking about here. You know, that somebody who's came here as a, as a young child only knows America and, you know, may not be able to get any of those unemployment benefits. And, um, you know, has been struggling. So, I mean, you know, when, when you, when you see, I think a, a, a face to, to, to the problem, it, you know, it becomes a little easier to understand, but I mean, no matter what, it's going to be hard for uh, people on the conservative side to obviously get behind that. And, and it's obviously definitely going to be a um, sticking point politically. And as, and as you said earlier, I, I was kind of surprised too, that this didn't really come up more, um, before it seemingly was just approved um didn't it seemed like it kind of went under the radar well also i guess they're going to pay for it with um an increase in taxes on the wealthiest new yorkers so i figured that was going to be a huge backlash as well and be another one of those wedges of this new people that live in new york city may now end up paying like the highest state and local taxes in the country um after california so i'm sure that's going to be a, a major talking point for the the conservatives about another reason why they're not very happy with this budget and this particular provision in the budget. Right. So the, the, we're, we on the East End are, are surrounded by, by both. We, are, we, are, uh, we interact every day with, with millionaires and multimillionaires, and we also interact uh, rather intimately with the uh, undocumented. So we're right in the middle of it here on Eastern Long Island. Yep. And yep. how will that play out? Will, uh, will the, all the... Uh, with all the cries of of uh, New Yorkers uh, leaving leaving the city, coming to the East End, now leaving the state altogether, as I mentioned earlier to you uh, the, yesterday, Bill, there's a Bridgehampton merchant who uh, I've heard say more than once, uh, "God bless the Blasio for driving all these people out of the city." I just hope Cuomo doesn't drive them out of the state. <laughs> <laughs> so we're in the, we're in a swirl here, yeah. but. Uh, our, our issue with is, is with refugees is that uh, we've been blessed with refugees that are affluent and self-sufficient and able to trickle uh, some of their resources our way. But you go home and you watch BBC or Euronews or, or uh, any uh, CNN, and you see that the, the refugee issue is just at the Rio Grande. It's all over the world. There are a lot of desperate people doing everything within their power to to flee circumstances that are unimaginable to to me, but I see it. I can I can I can intellectually understand what's happening, and and our brothers and sisters here in this country that fled from others, the humane thing to do is to reach out and uh, treat them with dignity and respect and be supportive. The conservative is, might, might even agree with that, but they'll say, "Is that government's role?" Mm-hmm. So th- that's that's the big question here, and that's what the contention is all about. Should the taxpayers be, should U.S. taxpayers, U.S. citizens be paying for people that are undocumented and theoretically entered the, the country illegally or stayed illegally? And what but, does that but, term even mean? That's the term illegal offense many people. So I hesitate but, to use it. It's just one of the terms. But as Joe points out, there, there, are, there are, are millions of people that have, have been here most of their lives. And it may be they may be undocumented, but, but they are certainly a part of a fabric of our, our community. And, and I think if we're, if we're talking about helping everybody through the pandemic, it certainly has to include um, you know, people that have been contributing to, to, to the economy out here and, and to society out here. Um, and, and yeah, you know, I, I think you know I've I've long been a proponent of of you know some kind of path to citizenship, and and I think maybe this is shows the first uh, first step to that 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 these are you know the the state is saying these are these are members of our community, and we're going to help them out um, just like we helped out everybody else through through the pandemic. Uh, well, there's certainly members of our East End community. You can yeah. go through a day without interacting, and most of the times quite favorably with somebody who just is more than likely undocumented. Right. So how do we address that? It's the reality. Let's 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 do the right thing. What the right thing is is what's debated. So so the budget also included um, hefty increases in state aid for for local school districts and I know Joe you guys wrote about it. Uh, Riverhead's going to 
going to see an increase of, of like 42% increase in, in their state aid. And I don't think that includes um, the federal bailout money either, right? I mean, I think that was a little different than that. What does that mean right. to River? That's $14 million increase in state aid this year. Yeah, I mean, you know, going back before the pandemic, um, you know, Riverhead schools had really had been fighting to try to get this uh, foundation aid, um, which they feel they had felt they'd been shorted for a long time and been rallying uh, to try to you know gain support to get this money. And then, um, you know, once the pandemic hit, you know, then it was like, well, now what's going to happen? You know, are they, you know, now they're really going to be screwed with um you know, with not getting this money. And, you know, we've seen in recent years, the enrollment's been going up and up in Riverhead and they're kind of gotten stretched uh, pretty thin, you know, a failed budget last year. And, you know, so there's been a lot of concern in the community. So this uh, news coming down now, um, the number here, $46.8 million in total aid, which you said is a 42% increase. Wow. Um, you know, it, it's, uh, it's huge. And um, is one of the, um, um, uh, Faculty Association president said, you know, it doesn't make us whole, but it's a good start and, you know, kind of gets them back more toward a level of playing field, I guess. And uh, and as you said, there's also um, additional money that they had gotten um, through the you know, pandemic aid from the from the from the feds as well. So, yeah, that additional money coming in out on top of this. aid. So, you know, it's de- definitely uh, good news. And uh, out of all the schools we cover out here, uh, definitely Riverhead was the biggest uh, biggest one to benefit from this. And, you know, while other schools will get some uh, additional money too, it was, it was Riverhead that definitely uh, really needed it the most. And that's one of the things you don't really talk about out here that much is the way in which schools are financed, which is, you know, the local taxes pay for it. So in a way, your your school district's only really as strong as your tax base, which is you really see the inequities like with what they deal with in, up in the spring school district where you don't have a lot of businesses, but you have the majority of the school children and they pay a, a much higher tax rate up there. And, and struck- there's okay. still all these like two, three room schoolhouses in right. other in wealthy areas that yeah. only educate like 10 or 15 kids. Right. I always yeah. wondered if there was ever going to be, you know, a larger look at it, especially out here on the East End where you have all these really small school districts that function in, as these little microcosms and, and not always in a very equitable manner. And um, I just wonder if there's ever going to be any any movement to sort of look at overhauling the um, the way that schools are sort of look financed and, and operate like this, because you do see these amazing budget inequities. Is, the wealthy is, people yeah. would be opposed to that. Yeah. Is the answer consolidating districts? I mean, we've talked about that a, a number of times, and I, I think that you, you have you have these small school districts and people who 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 live in them that really like that local that local control and that feel of of the you know old time one one room schoolhouse and all that. But but I don't know that that's just sustainable forever. Yeah. And yeah, I, you I mentioned really spring. Like, so so I, you mentioned spring. Springs also had a forty percent increase in school aid, but the increase was only. Five hundred thousand dollars compared to the fourteen million dollars in Riverhead. So I mean, that just kind of shows the inequity. Yeah, it's great that they get a forty percent boost, but yeah, I have a feeling that the state may eventually make them think about consolidation or figure out a new way to do it. I mean, the other problem is you have school districts that you know like their little you know one room school or their small school, but then as soon as there's talk of oh we're going to put fourteen affordable housing units in that district, they scream bloody murder because suddenly they don't want to have to take these new kids who they then. Double their 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 population of students. Not only that, but you know, like in East Hampton, then they have to they have to actually pay to send all of those kids to the high school when that time comes. They actually have to pay tuition. Like Springs has to pay tuition to East Hampton High School, um, and it's not cheap. Um, so that's another another big thing. So it really doesn't make um, any of these districts want to take on, you know, any any kind of affordable housing or workforce housing initiatives because they're afraid that it'll mess up the the school population in a way that will then make them have to pay a lot more to educate these kids. So yeah, it's a very, I think it's a little bit of an archaic system. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if the state eventually comes down with a mandate to look at consolidating some of these districts. Yeah, I thought it was interesting. Um, a couple of days ago, I think um, Newsday actually ran an editorial kind of saying, you know, it's time, you know, maybe with this influx of money, uh, schools should, you know, start looking at Kind of lowering lowering their taxes a little bit because you know that they're you know they've got, gotten this uh, big boost of money and you know maybe there's a way to ease the burden a little bit on the taxpayers. 
I, I think that's interesting, but but you know, you've got that boost of money this year. Is there any guarantee that you're going to see the same kind of money next year? I mean, I imagine right. how much yeah. this year was was prompted by by COVID and all that. And let's you know make the make the districts try to make the districts whole. But if you start budgeting for you know a fourteen million dollar increase this year, and 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 you lose that next year, then all of a sudden you've got this huge budget hole. But, um, you're, listening, you're listening to Behind the Headlines on WLIW FM. I'm Bill Sutton from the Express News Group. I'm joined by my co-host Annette Hinkle from the Express News Group, uh, Beth Young from the East End Beacon, Michael Mackey from WLIW FM and Joe Workmeister from the Suffolk Times and Riverhead News Review. Uh, Joe, you had um, you guys wrote a wonderful story this week about, a, uh, speaking of schools, a, a Mattituck teen who got some, uh, some attention on Twitter following a, a certain, her senior photograph. Talk about that a little bit. Great story. Yeah, this was um, kind of, kind of a, a wild uh, story how this kind of unfolded. Um, you know, like we do every year, you know, the schools send out, you know, who the uh, uh, valedictorian and salutatorians are. And, you know, you get a headshot of, of the kids. And, um, you know, so, you know, we, uh, last week we had run a story just on in the Suffolk Times highlighting who the um, vows and sales were for each of the local schools. And the Mattatuck salutatorian had a u- unique photo. Um, she was dressed, uh, what would you would call goth and, uh, you know, dark look, had these uh, horns on, on her head and, uh, you know, kind of unique uh, jewelry and earrings and and had a pretty, it was a, it was a cool look. Um, it was different, obviously. And um, so, you know, we thought, oh, that's pretty cool. You know, we ran the photo like we would um, anything else and, you know, didn't really uh, think anything too much more of it. And then um, over the weekend, uh, somebody had seen it in the paper and went and, and searched for it online, found found the photo and tweeted it out and just kind of a, a screenshot of the photo. And um, and all the tweet said was, you go, girl. And that, that went fr- out Friday night. And by Saturday, it had pretty much gone viral. And um, by Sunday, I guess, it had gotten up to uh, 500,000 likes, I think. Wow. Over, over half a million it likes. And, all um, over the world. Yeah, it went crazy. And then, you know, by Monday morning, it was kind of like the media swarm got to her to try to, you know, get get, get an interview. And uh, so I was able to talk to her Monday and, and kind of get her story about you know who she is. And and um, and, she's, and she's, she's had got, a little bit of a hard life leading up to this. Right. Yeah. She you know, she's had she had some struggles in life. And, and uh, a couple of years ago, um, ended up missing school for a long time and was out for for a few months and, you know, had to focus on our health and recovery and, and um, our mental health, mental health and get through some things and uh, was able to get through that and got back. And as her mom said, made up all that missed school work within a month. And it was, you know, right back. Um, what a testament to her that she was able to talk to you about that stuff. And I think it was a, an, an eating disorder that, that, yeah. that kind of put her behind. And, and, and interesting too, that, I mean, that speaks to, you know, to self image and she, you know, I think she, it, it, it appears to me from reading your article that she's kind of overcome some of those image issues by creating this new goth image that she's very comfortable with. And she's just comfortable in her skin now. Right. Yeah, yeah, and you know, it, it's it's great that she was able to kind of find um, that in herself to you know what was going to make her comfortable, what was going to make her happy, and kind of help her get through you know seeing herself the way um, you know she she wanted to be seen, and she and this uh, and so basically once um, she kind of got through that, that's when she kind of started this um, more of a goth look and, and kind of switched her wardrobe up and, and embraced this kind of new, uh, persona, I guess you could say. And, uh, and, and, it, and that's really, uh, helped her along the way. And, and, you know, and sure, you know, she'll get some, uh, occasional stares or, you know, somebody may make a weird comment here or there, but, you know, she, she kind of knows that's going to happen and, and, you know, she's able to brush that off. And, and what I thought was really amazing was, you know, she, now she that her story kind of got out there she really hopes that other people will see this you know other kids who may be struggling to um you, you know kind of figure Find themselves right out now, that yeah. you know that they can see her and say hey it's okay to be who i want to be and you know i don't have to try to conform to whatever everyone else thinks you know i should be or how i should look 
or whatever it may, may be. And, and, you know, as you said, you know, you have to, you know, you have to, uh, you know, kind of really, you know, love yourself, I guess. And before you can go out and, and accomplish other things, you know, so that's kind of the most important thing. You got to take care of yourself first. And, um, you know, she's able to do that now. And, uh, and, uh, you know, obviously she's a salutatorian, so she's got a, a, a big future ahead of her. She wants to do, um, get into like forensics and potentially be like a medical examiner. And, uh, you know, I guess that kind of, uh, dark side of things is, <laughs> is what she's into. So working on uh, dead people is something she would uh, act, seem to enjoy uh, okay. in, in the cool. future. How I cool. see new theory the CSI. That's exactly. a great college essay topic, though. If she didn't write about it, that would have been a pretty amazing. Yeah, I know. We were talking about that in the newsroom about how, you know, I don't know, you know, how she wrote uh, college essays. But obviously now this story would uh, would have been fantastic if she, if she, if she actually you know, did write like that. And, uh, she is waiting to hear back from some colleges now. So I, I would assume she'll get some, uh, some, some definite, uh, accept acceptances, uh, in, in that package when, uh, once you get the, once you get those in the mail. It's such a great message for teenagers right now. who are really hurting so badly. Um, just the social isolation right now has been devastating to so many. And, uh, you know, I, I went to Mattatuck high school and I can't, I couldn't imagine that ever happening when I, <laughs> when I went to school there, like she would have been mercilessly ridiculed. And it's so heartening to see that like things have really changed. You know? Yeah. High school is really hard. It really yeah. is hard for those kids, especially this last year. Yeah. Right. I think the strongest elements of this story is that she's able to present her own unique look yet successfully, very successfully navigate through uh, mainstream uh, uh, academics and uh, become saluted. It's agreed to let her take her uh, senior picture in that gothic look, as long as she also consented to have conventional photos taken of her. So someday, 50 years from now, she can look back and see herself straight and also as a, as a gothic uh, image has become Oh, I mean, nationally yeah. <laughs> yeah, part of part of the deal was she, so she had originally taken, uh, I guess, what you call a regular yearbook photo. Yeah. And that was kind of the compromise she had made with her mom who wanted to have pictures of her, you know, kind of, uh, you know, as I guess she would prefer to you know see her. So she did that photo first and then went back and did a retake and dressed as she wanted and, and yeah. knew that that was going to be the photo that she uh, ultimately put in the yearbook. But obviously never thought it would go kind of beyond the school community and uh, certainly not as uh, viral across the Internet as it did. Um, yeah, she's appealing to, to all generations the way she's come across there. So it is a terrific story, Joe. There, there was some negative comment too, right? Or was it mostly positive uh, online? And I think again, it speaks to her strength that she was able to, yeah. to just yeah, yeah. There definitely was some negatives. I think especially when it first went out, before it kind of picked up steam. You know, some people were chiming in. Um, you know, and uh, you know, I think she got some weird stuff uh, sent to her. Uh, certainly, some, and there were some weird comments. But once it kind of picked up uh, steam, I think the um, general positivity and about her, you know, embracing herself like that, um, really started to outweigh any of the uh, of the negative comments, and it was um, uh, really all positive in in the end. I think. Good for her, and good for the for the community. So what's her name? Her name is uh, Veronica. I'm actually not even 100 percent sure how to pronounce her last name. It's a Polish Polish name. And, yeah, I was and taking a, a shot at it on there and trying to get it right. <laughs> yeah, no, I forgot to ask her how she actually pronounces her last name. You don't need to do that in print. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Spell it right, which is sometimes a challenge. Yeah, I know that. I mean, wow. that's how I would pronounce it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and her, her mom had a great story too about you know she was born in Poland and her, her, her dad was born in Poland too, and her, the mom came here when she was eighteen and didn't speak any English, and um, so this girl's you know first first generation American. And um, so, you know, it's even more impressive of uh, what she's accomplished. Well, yes, sir. It's, it's a great story. Great, strong family there. You're listening to Behind the Headlines on WLIW-FM. I'm Bill Sutton from the Express News Group, joined by my co-host, Annette Hinkle from the Express News Group, Joe Workmeister from the Suffolk Times Riverhead News Review, Michael Mackey, the local host for the Long Island Morning Edition on WLIW-FM, and Beth Young, publisher-editor of the East and Beacon. 
So we ran a, a, a story this week um, about Southampton Village looking to um, looking at the process of renewing permits for outdoor dining this spring and, and summer, and and also looking at reinstituting the uh, uh, Southampton in the streets, which was kind of an event they were holding every weekend last summer, most weekends last summer through the. Uh, through the the pandemic where they kind of closed down Main Street and Job's Lane to to allow outdoor dining. And I'm just wondering what what you guys are hearing about outdoor dining and and whether you think people are going to feel more comfortable going into restaurants um, as as the pandemic kind of eases and wanes. I read an article this morning that said that we're probably not going to see normal at least until um, holiday season next winter after kids in school get vaccinated and the vaccinations get younger and younger. So I'm thinking probably outdoor dining is going to be a, a good option that way to, as far as staying safe. But on a larger note, I mean, I think people just loved the outdoor dining and the opportunities that the different villages and, and towns allowed, um, you know, restaurant owners to, to do outdoor dining. And, you know, we, we had a lot of conversations about it last summer, but it, it really kind of changed the atmosphere of, of our main streets to allow the outdoor dining. So what do you guys think about that? Why was outdoor dining not allowed previously? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, it was part of the code and I think there were- I don't know. Per se, it's the per health se department occupancy right. standards. Yeah, yeah, I know like what they did in Sag Harbor is they allowed you to, whatever your occupancy was allowed inside, you couldn't add any more seats outside, but you trade away what you were normally allowed to do inside and put those number of seats outside. And, um, and I think it's been a huge success. I know in Sac Harbor, I mean, in Sac Harbor always had a pretty good dining scene, but, um, but it really made it feel sort of like a, you know, European village in the middle of a pandemic. And, um, yeah. and a lot of the restaurants spent a lot of money. Um, like I am thinking of Sen in particular in the American hotel um, and even LT burger, they, they spent a lot of money sort of fixing up these outdoor spaces. So I, um, I'm guessing that they don't want to give up on that right uh, at this point. And, and I think that it's become really popular and, um, and it just sort of adds to adds to the life of the village. And I think all of the villages would probably benefit and, and want to see it come back. Is my guess. Yeah. I, I mean, I mean, absolutely. Joe, Joe, you guys in Riverhead, I mean, was, was there a big push toward outdoor dining in it? I'm, I, um, Last, last summer, you think you'll see that come back? I know that they have the um, the the live on 25 um, events, too. I think they tried to do a little of that last year, right? Yeah. It, you know, instead of doing the live on 25, they switched gears and called it Dine on 25 and right. you know, had the outdoor set up and tables in the street and you know, shut everything down for um, a couple of Thursdays during the summer. And, you know, that was in addition to just, you know, restaurants typically having tables set up outside their particular spot. Uh, so that was kind of an expanded uh, outdoor dining for you know, a couple of days in the summer. So, uh, you know, they are trying to do that again. You know, as of right now, they're still holding out hope that they can do a regular Alive on 25. Um, you know, it just kind of depends on whether, you know, regulations would allow for a gathering of that size. Um, I, I'm not too... Uh, optimistic that that would um, go forward this summer. So we, I think we could see another Dine on 25 series. Um, and again, yeah, I think there'll be plenty of uh, restaurants uh, in downtown Riverhead doing outdoor seating. And yeah, I think people uh, definitely definitely were into it. And it was also huge out in uh, Greenport Village uh, last summer. Right. We had to set up the parklets um, uh, for the restaurants to set up tables. And that seemed, you know, we wrote a lot about that last summer and into the fall, you know, they kind of kept pushing it uh, farther and farther and went through like Thanksgiving, I think. So, I mean, people were out there when it was pretty cold out and still, still enjoying it. So yeah, yeah. I think that's going to be something here to stay. Uh, it, you know, it, it, when you get into these villages like Greenport, you know, it does get tough because you sort of have this trade off where you lose some parking to accommodate um, the outdoor uh, dining so that gets a little tricky when, you know, anytime you lose parking, because obviously there's not a ton in some of these small villages. So, you know, that's one thing that they have to kind of uh, try to try to figure out going forward. But, yeah, you know, I think the outdoor dining is here to stay. 
And, and, and as Annette pointed out, I, I think that, that there's the trade off as well. Um, with the outdoor dining, you lose some of the indoor dining. And as those restrictions are eased a little bit, that that might come into play. And I'm curious to see how the municipalities deal with that and how the county deals with that. If you still want to have that outdoor dining, but increase your indoor dining. Are you guys are you guys ready to get back into the restaurants? I know that I've had a couple lunches with friends. Um, at, at the diner and, and for a burrito, um, you know, and with, with vaccinated friends. And, and I felt pretty comfortable going into the restaurants. There's still some limitations, but the still it's in the, in, in the back of your mind, there's a little bit of fear of, uh, I don't know if this is a good idea or not. I mean, you kind of get into it, but Annette, are, are you ready to go indoor dining? I actually did go and have an indoor dinner at 1770 house on Easter Sunday. Um, and they're still maintaining the social distancing. And um, I felt pretty comfortable. I've had both of my vaccinations. Um, so, um, yeah, it wasn't much of a thought for me. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm, we're not going out a ton. I mean, honestly, we've, so, we've realized how much money we save by cooking every meal at home. And, <laughs> like, um, and that has sort of uh, become our, our new uh, our new go to. And, and maybe we've just become lazy. But the idea of actually leaving the house is like a big deal. <laughs> you got to take the sweatpants off, right? I mean, <laughs> uh, that's the only thing that fits anymore, unfortunately. So, um, but I don't know, like we're not going crazy with the outdoor dining. Um, yeah. I mean, the indoor dining yet, um, we've only been out, but 1770 house did a, a wonderful job and, you know, the staff is still masked and I feel pretty confident um, doing that, you know, but again, I've had both of my vaccinations and, you know, we're wearing the masks inside, but it's funny. I'm starting to forget sometimes. Like I'll walk out of the car. I'm like, Oh, I forgot my mask. It's sort of, sort of like we're, you know, we're starting to come out of the other, other end, I think. So. Yeah. I, I have to admit that I went with a friend last night to Jake's 58, just to, just to check it out. And they, have, they have some restrictions there and I'm not, I, I don't want to come across as a degenerate gambler. I, I go maybe once or twice a year to, to Jake's 58, but I mean, they, the precautions that they had made me feel very comfortable. They check your temperature uh, walking in and then they make you take your mask off and they take a picture of you for some reason, I guess, in case somebody wants to, um, the, well, that's a big thing about it. You, you used but, to not be able to go into banks wearing a mask, but then you had to start going into the bank. Exactly. <laughs> and they had plexiglass in between all the different machines, and it started to fill up later on, and and we kind of took off because it was starting to get a little a little crowded. But it, I, I have to say, it felt like normal. It really, you know, a little bit, and just going in there and and being part of a crowd, and um, you know, listening to the the lights and sirens on, on all the machines. It was, it was kind of fun. So how much uh, did you lose? I'm sorry. How much did you lose? I broke even and I'm always happy when I break even. There you go. I, I lost a little and I won a little The the trick is, is when you're up on one of the machines, you got to cash out. So you've got a paper ticket instead of money and you just put that paper ticket in your pocket. So if, if you do that all night and as you're up a little bit and keep cashing out by the end of the night, you're pretty much where you started. Although it would have been nice to win big. Yeah. That's why you go, right? Beth, are you are you comfortable going to restaurants? Uh, I went to Boom Burger in West Hampton uh, oh, two days ago. The first time we had been in a restaurant in um, in uh, forever. It's kind of a takeout place, but they have a big dining room with a filter that's sealed off from the rest of the uh, the place, and uh, we were the only people there, and we had a great time. But it was really weird. <laughs> yeah. No, it yeah. is. That, that first like, time is like, you know, it's yeah. like I've never been in a restaurant before. Right. Yeah. Well, it's also, I was like, what do we do here? Where do we put the napkins? <laughs> and if you're alone, it is sort of like you're eating at home because there's nobody else there. Right? <laughs> <All right. laughs> yeah. One of my greatest concerns is I've met a bunch of people the past year of whom I've never seen them without a mask. And what's yeah. scarier still, they've never seen me without a mask. <laughs> I, I kind of like the pref I prefer the mask lately. I think I'm going to. I like it. Yeah. Yeah. Because I just, feel bolder. I, I feel mysterious a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> I ran into Brian Cosgrove outside your office the other day, and I went through like every name in my head. I was like, I know him. The mask <laughs> is really throwing me off. Masked man. <laughs> I do wonder how much the masks will, you know, kind of stick around just as a kind of a norm. If, you know, if you're going out, you don't necessarily feel well, you just throw a mask on and, you know, keep 
keep other people from maybe getting sick, you know? It's, and the fact that none of us have got the flu or a cold in the last right. year, like, wow, there's yeah. something. I, have, some I haven't had sniffles in, uh, since 2019. Right. The last, the, the only fever I've gotten in the last 14 months was the fever I, I had to suffer through for a short while after my second vaccination shot. So the, the masks and the distancing does keep us healthier, doesn't it? Did you have the Moderna, Michael? Yes, I did. I went to uh, I went to a Miller Place Rite Aid on March second, then returned on March thirtieth. We talk a lot about traffic out here and and complain, but uh, now we're talking about Miller Place and Rocky Point. They're just a few hamlets uh, west of Riverhead, and that's a whole different traffic situation than here. Not only that, they have cameras at the, the red light. So holy crow, you feel like yeah, Big man. Brother's watching you. <laughs> you, you, get, you get one of those tickets and you learn how to stop at a red light. Yeah, <laughs> it is. Yeah, yellow does not mean speed up. <laughs> That's right. It, it's come to a full stop before you turn right on red. You're so we have it pretty good out here in many ways. And uh, although it is more crowded than ever before. Yep. You're listening to Behind the Headlines on WLIWFM. I'm Bill Sutton from the Express News Group, joined by my co-host Annette Hinkle from the Express News Group, Beth Young from East End Beacon, Joe Workmeister from the Suffolk Times Riverhead News Review, and Michael Mackey from WLIWFM. Let's talk about pot. Yeah. Uh, so I know that that you guys, when I wasn't here on the show last week, but you guys talked a little bit about um, about legalized recreational marijuana, and I know that Michael Mackey wanted to talk a little bit about the uh, Shinnecock Nation's plan. They had, um, they've long planned for uh, to, to have medical marijuana cultivation and a dispensary on the reservation. Um, but now they're they're talking about possibly, um, since the the state approved um, recreational marijuana last month, they're talking about kind of switching gears a little bit. And I think there, there's still going to be a vote in May. But they put out a press release um, this week that that pretty much I, I think. Um, kind of lets the cat out of the bag. I, I, I would be surprised if they didn't move in that direction. What were your thoughts on that, Michael? Well, they were showing some concerns, uh, first of all, about how uh, the, the, the state's cooperation with them developing a medical marijuana cultivation and dispensary. But they, they state, they told the Mark Harrington of Newsday that that's forthcoming very soon. As far as the uh, recreational marijuana cultivation and sales, Brian Polite states that it must get the full approval of everyone on the reservation, not just the uh, the tribal council. But he also emphasized that they can uh, uh, they can uh, grow and sell marijuana as they please on their on their nation's uh, uh, property. And, you know, it seems to me this is now personal opinion. They the, there's a string of smoke shops there. It's only natural that they would uh, sell recreational marijuana. What will be interesting is it sounds to me like uh, the Shinnecock are going to go ahead and start selling it before the state at large does so. So that will be, we'll talk about, that could create a, a traffic situation if the only place you can buy uh, legal pot is at the Southampton Reservation. Whoa, look out. Yeah, people but are driving. That seems more appropriate to me than a gambling casino there. The, the, the gambling casino is an ongoing uh, traffic situation. When you were at... Uh, Jake's fifty-eight the other night. Bill, is that? Did you get a? Did you transplant what was happening there to uh, Montauk Highway and in, in Southampton? And well, I mean, what, it was, what were your thoughts? It, it's still kind of. <clears throat> it was it was limited attendance and you know limited number of machines and all that. So it wasn't. I, I've seen it really busy before. It wasn't that busy. I mean, there were spots in the parking lot. I mean, I've been there pre-COVID and you kind of kind of circle the parking lot or, or, or let the guy park your car or whatever, but it wasn't that um, last night. So it, it, it's, it, it's hard to tell. And, you know, it's different up there because it's off the expressway and then they've got the access right. road there. And, and so kind of, it's really set up um, yeah. well, I think to handle that traffic. Um, but we'll see. I mean, as, as far as, you know, as, as far as pot sales, um, you know, on, on the on the territory you know, and traffic, I think, you know, people are people are driving slowly by there anyway. Imagine if they're buying, right. you know, if they're buying, you know, cannabis, they're just going to be driving even even more slowly. So, I think, I think, <laughs> yeah, they still haven't come up with a good way to test the driving under the influence of pot, have they? No, I think that's the big stick sticking point. Right. I don't know how you do that. No. 
It's going to be. I do find it hypocritical. Some of the uh, listening to some state senator up island talk about, well, where are they going to sell this? Are they going to be selling it near schools? Well, you know, every uh, how close are delis and uh, liquor stores to schools? It's a exactly. the hypocrisy of of a marijuana versus we glorify alcohol and, and demonize uh, marijuana. That's it's it's. I don't think it's a good message. We should educate people regarding the uh, the, the results of of both, but don't don't uh, demonize one and glorify the other. It's just not healthy. It's not, it's not and it's not true. I know. Teenagers, teenagers will never will never find weed if uh, as long as it's not sold right. near the school. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah, right. So, how much do we know about the facility? Make sure there's no woods next to the school. Right. How much? <laughs> how much do we know about the facility that they want to put up on at um, on the Shinnecock Reservation? Are are they talking about like producing gummies and all these other edibles, or is it pure um, smoke smoking of marijuana? Or, or what do we know about that? The product itself, you mean? No, I haven't said heard anything about what, exactly the product, but they're working with organizations with, in the tribal community at large throughout the country to put this together. They're, it's going to be their own thing, but generally speaking, conform with what the New York State uh, is, is setting up. Well, is my and, and, and I think they're smart if they can corner the market and kind of get ahead of... Um, of the you know the legalization I guess takes effect in effect in, in 2022. So if they can, they're they're already you know have the plans for for facilities there. So um, you know they might as well take advantage well, of that. And, and ver- various municipalities can opt out, which is interesting. So right. like how how can like villages opt opt out or is it on the county level? Um, villages, towns, um, any municipality can opt out just of the sales. I mean, obviously cannabis would still be legal within the boundaries of the villages and i think you could still grow it within within the uh, within the villages and towns but they can say no we're not going to have any smoke shops so, so if the county that, was considering that the last time this came up but i think they got a lot of pushback at the public hearings and they just dropped it no, i mean if, like, if they opted out that could make that would be huge for the for the shinnecock if the if the municipality opted out because they would yeah. be the only literally the only game in town so i think yeah, yeah i think i think newsday had a story uh, the other day where the, I guess some of these, uh, all the town uh, heads got, had a meeting together. And I think part of their reasoning was that, you know, they, there's no way they can really opt out uh, is because of this uh, Shinnecock um, proposal is going forward, no matter what. So the, I think the reasoning is, you know, what good is it going to be if we say we're going to opt out in, you know, uh, Brookhaven town, but then everyone could just drive to the reservation and get it anyway. So, uh, I think it kind of forced uh, the town's hands right off the bat. Well, the same thing, if one town opts out and the other town does, people are just going to cross the border, right. and, 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 you know, and all that. So what about the, the Mastic Reservation? Do we know anything? Are they considering branching out into marijuana? Do we have we heard? I haven't heard any. Heard. But I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, there's, you know, there's 20 smoke shops down there, a gas station and, mm-hmm. and all that. I mean, if it's if it's allowed. Absolutely. Yeah. OK, we are out of time listening to behind the headlines on wliw fm Um, i'm bill sutton from the express news group my co-host annette hinkle from the express news group joe workmeister editor of the suffolk times overhead news review michael mackey local host for long island morning edition on wliw fm and beth young publisher editor of the east end beacon thank you guys so much this was a great show and we'll have you on again really soon